Hello, everybody. Uh, this is another episode of Upfront uh, with me at Leaflet. Today, we have two very distinguished guests uh, to noted jurist, former uh, judge of the Supreme Court of India, Justice Lokur, who headed the social justice branch of the court for many years and uh, is one of the rare judges who has been very vocal uh, and voicey for us on the issues of human rights. Uh, civil liberties and uh, judicial activism. And we have uh, Indra Jaising, again, a very noted human rights lawyer and former uh, additional solicitor general of India. Uh, welcome uh, to Upfront program uh, at the leaflet, Justice Lokur. I would like to start with you, uh, Justice Lokur. Uh, you, or since you retired, have been writing a series of papers and articles on the issue of civil liberties and fundamental rights. And it has been a concern in a country increasingly over the last few years, the way uh, the state uh, has been uh, uh, suppressing freedom of speech and uh, has been denying civil liberties to many people who have been incarcerated on supposedly, seemingly uh, flimsy charges. Uh, you wrote a recent piece. Uh, this is in the wake of the Delhi High Court judgment on Natasha Narwal, Devangna, Kalita, and Asifik Bal's bail application, uh, where the Delhi High Court interpreted UAPA in a certain way before uh, giving bail to the three uh, student activists. And you pointed out five questions. So I'd like to start with that, uh, Justice Lokur. Um, what is your biggest concern with the way of one, the, the Delhi High Court uh, interpreted UAPA and then following which the Supreme Court had stayed the order, yeah, practically stayed the order. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Ashish. <clears throat> you know, uh, first of all, I just want to uh, clarify that I have not commented on the judgment of the Delhi High Court. In fact, uh, I've said that in the first paragraph itself, that I'm not making any comment on the judgment of the Delhi High Court. I was only concerned with the process that was involved in the initially uh, refusal of uh, bail by the trial court. But as far as the, uh, uh, the interpretation of uh, the law is concerned by uh, the Delhi High Court, you know, you have to go back into the provisions of the UAPA. And while doing that, you have to go back to the provisions of uh, TADA, Terrorist and uh, you know, Disruptive Activities Act, OTA, uh, Prevention of Terrorism Act, and then uh, comes UAPA. Essentially, essentially, uh, I believe that bail is a matter of right. You know, it's not a matter of discretion for the judge. Of course, the judge has to you know, also you uh, use his discretion, his or her discretion in granting or refusing to grant bail and imposing conditions. But it's really a matter of right, which right can be curtailed or stopped on the basis of submissions made by the prosecution. Now, if you look at it from that point of view, under TADA, uh, it was said that that was the first law, 1987. Uh, they had said that uh, bail can be refused if there are reasonable grounds for believing that the person uh, is not guilty of the offense. Okay. Now, how do you say that a person is not guilty of the offense? The person who is accused of the offense will say, listen, I'm not guilty. All right. Now, the public prosecutor has to be heard. He will say he's guilty. So the court will have to see why the public prosecutor is saying he's guilty. It will also have to see why the accused is saying he's not guilty. So there will have to be this, uh, you know, arguments uh, back and forth, so to speak, uh, that the court will have to look into and then come to a conclusion that I think that there are reasonable grounds for believing that this person is guilty. In POTA, it was more or less the same, right? Uh, except that instead of reasonable grounds for believing, uh, they said grounds for believing. Okay, but really that doesn't make much of a difference because it still has to be reasonable. Grounds for believing that he is not guilty. Now, if you look at it in that light, under UAPA, the bail provision says 
reasonable grounds for believing that the accusation is prima facie true. Okay. Now, in all three statutes, both the sides have to be heard. Otherwise, an accused will say that, listen, why are you hearing the other side? I'm telling you I'm not guilty. And these are the reasons I'm giving you why I'm not guilty. Don't hear the other side. But that, that would be a very strange uh, sort of a situation. So similarly, under uh, UAPA, if the prosecution says that, listen, I think there are reasonable grounds for believing that what I'm saying is uh, you know, prima facie true, the accused can say, listen, uh, uh, this uh, public prosecutor is not uh, giving the entire truth, or there are no reasonable grounds for believing that what he is saying is prima facie true. So there has to be a hearing of both the sides. And this is something which has been acknowledged by the Delhi High Court. And the Delhi High Court has then come to the conclusion after hearing both the sides that, listen, we don't think there's any evidence against this person. And therefore, prima facie, we don't think that there is any ground for believing that the accusation made is prima facie true. That being the position, the provisions of UAPA are not attracted and therefore the persons are entitled to pay. So it's, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a sequence uh, that has been going on since uh, 1987. And I think uh, the conclusion of the Delhi High Court is logical in that sense. But besides the, the bail provisions and, uh, and where you, you, you explained the process involved in uh, disposing of the bail applications of the accused under the UAPA Act, uh, you have also raised uh, questions about the police uh, uh, process in the sense that how the charge sheets were not delivered on time, how the physical charge sheets were not given or were perhaps deliberately de uh, denied, and even uh, the registration of multiple FIRs. Some of these FIRs seem to be more tactical. You also highlighted that how when accused got bail in one FIR, they were arrested in the court at the very same time when they were bailed out in the earlier FIR. And uh, even when they were bailed, by the Delhi High Court, that order was again forestalled, which, which means that the Delhi, the, the police, Delhi police said that, look, we have to verify the addresses. So the all in, in culmination, uh, Justice Lokur, it seems that uh, there was a witch hunt against these student activists and which you have highlighted. And this witch hunt doesn't uh, restrict uh, to this case. It has been going on in, in various other cases as well, which is, the way the sedition law has been applied, the way uh, uh, no, uh, the, the right to protest peacefully has been denied. And uh, an MP recently was arrested under sedition uh, act and sedition law and was also tortured during police custody. So uh, is there a pattern in the way the state has been acting against those it believe are ideologically opposed to, to, to its stance? Do you see a pattern? Uh, you know, I'm not sure whether it's only ideological, right? Uh, it's it's a question of disagreement also, uh, in the sense that uh, you know I may have the same ideology as a particular person, but I don't agree with that person, you know, or I don't agree with the policies of that uh, person or the views of that person, even though the ideology may be the same. So it's it's not really uh, you know so much ideological as a general pattern that if somebody does something wrong, you know, uh, let, let's <laughs> fix that person uh, kind of thing. You know, that uh, famous, uh, you know, Tokto kind of attitude. <laughs> that That is what is, uh, you know, a little troubling. Right. I would, uh, you know, come back to this uh, point that you just raised that, th that this, this approach of Tokto has, is becoming a, a norm. Uh, and the default uh, rule by which the state is playing. Uh, but I'd, before that, I'd li like to ask Indra one question. Indra, uh, you know, you have been representing the Bhima Koregaon accused uh, uh, before the courts. Uh, what is your interpretation of a terrorist act? Because while deciding the bail application of the three student activists we just uh, spoke about, the Delhi High Court had to go into the definitional issues 
which is section 15 what is the terrorist act whether there was a prima facie case of terrorism uh what, according to you what is terrorism is inciting a riot an act of terrorism uh, ashish uh, i will also preface uh, my comments with a caveat uh, uh, you point out that i am representing some of the accused in the bima koregaon case and the matter is sub judice so i will not refer to the facts of that case however you know that uh, worldwide we don't have a standardized definition of what is terrorism all we have is uh, what is a terrorist act uh, now i would however like to put on the table my definition of uh, terrorism from a reading of international law at the heart of the issue of terrorism is uh, intimidation an act of intimidation so uh, what is terrorism it is intimidating the government to do or not to do something the impact of which is felt by ordinary citizens of that state ordinary citizens of india i would say uh, for example you might say that the hijacking of the aircraft at kandahar was an act of terrorism because demands were made release so and so so and so so and so and uh, failing which the aircraft will be blown up so that would be a classical case of uh, terrorism and a terrorist terrorist act however uh, my approach to the question that you raised is to look at the plain meaning of the section now i would like to draw your attention to the plain wording of section 15 of the unlawful activities prevention act of 1967 and this is what it says whoever does any act with intent to threaten or likely to threaten now please listen carefully to these words the unity the integrity the security the economic security brought in by an amendment by the U- upa government or the sovereignty of india or with intent to strike terror or likely to strike terror in the people or any section of the people now pause here as uh, intelligent thinking people we know the distinction between an act which threatens the unity of india the integrity of india the security of india and the sovereignty of india granted there is some ambiguity about the use of the word sovereignty but in my opinion it is used here in the to- context of unity integrity and it's probably meant to refer to territorial sovereignty what i have noticed in actual practice is that this section is invoked in the case of an ordinary act of violence by the way the section also requires to be a terrorist act at the use of deadly weapons uh, which cause death or likely are likely to cause death etc now what i found is that uh, looking at the cases that are registered in india i have found that none of those even state in the fir that there was an attempt to attack or threaten the unity or integrity or sovereignty of india the problem i think here is the way the law is being interpreted by the police the prosecution the decision makers is that they collapse the difference between government and india right as justice lokur pointed out you may disagree with the policy of the government of india you may dissent you may oppose you may protest it doesn't amount to an attack on india and i think it's very important for us to make that distinction between an attack on india and an attack on a policy of a government otherwise we are liable to end up in a situation where you say the government is india and india is the government or you say a particular individual in the government is india and india is that one individual so we really need to distinguish between the two and my i have been saying for very long every riot is an offense under the indian penal code but not every riot is an act of terrorism 
this is the essential difference that we need to make when we are looking at laws. Right. So uh, fine, but there are but there are riots and then there are organized riots. So what if there are organizations? who by sloganeering, by organizing meetings, by giving call to people to arms, uh, first create an environment of, of communal uh, disharmony, communal discord. They give a call for a band and then they organize their cadres, they distribute arms and weapons to them and then they raid a particular neighborhood and they kill more than 100 people. What is that? Yeah. This is not an ordinary riot. This is a very organized, riot and it strikes terror in the people. Is it not terrorism? Yeah, so Ashish, rather than talking abstractly, I think we need to refer to real life situations. No, which I, I'm, I'm, in... I'm talking to real life situations. So suppose Naroda Patia in 2002, yeah. we, yes. saw the, we, we have now convictions both by the trial court and also by the high court. Convictions yes. have been upheld by the high court. That's right. Uh -huh. so I will... Yes. So so I, if, I can just, if I can just uh, refer to the trial court judgment where the judge actually uses the word terrorism while convicting them and says that they struck terror in the people. So yes. is that not terrorism? Right. So when I was uh, referring to real life situations, I really wanted to come back to the some of the most recent, what we have come to describe as pogroms, we don't even call them riots anymore. And uh, there, is a, there is a debate in the public domain that you don't even call it a program, you call it genocide, okay? So we know what happened in 1992, post the demolition of the Babri Masjid, we have also seen Gujarat 2002. And I would, I would say that yes, those are cases where uh, your section 15 of the UAPA act could have been invoked, but and also, and also 1984 riots. That's right. That, yeah. that, that is right. 19, uh, 1984 as well. Uh, I would say that those are cases where section 15 of the act could have been invoked, but was not invoked. And so that brings you to the question, how come this act is not invoked in a situation like that, whereas it is invoked for somebody like uh, uh, Disha Ravi or Natasha or, or any of the recent cases that we've seen. Yeah. Now, so the only conclusion I can draw is that prosecution in this country is a political act. And uh, let us not forget that who launches the prosecution, right? Who launches it? It's the police. And who is the police accountable to? The police at the end of the day in this country uh, is accountable to the Ministry of Home Affairs, right? So although the Ministry of Home Affairs cannot interfere with an investigation, that's the law, but the act of invocation itself of a particular law becomes a political act. And in that sense, I think we are seeing um, an ideological use of the law. Justice, right. you asked the question and Justice Lokur responded, but yeah. it is an ideological use of the law. I can give you examples, but they're sub -judice. In the case of Bhima Koregao, I have raised the issue in my petition of what we now call selective prosecution. Why go to Bhima Koregao? Let's have a look at West Bengal. Uh, the Sudhendra Adhikari and Mukul Roy were not prosecuted in relation to the same Narada scam for which sitting ministers mm. of the West Bengal government were arrested. So this is an act of selective prosecution which is violative of Article 14 of the Constitution of India. I, I'd like to go back to Justice Lokur. Justice Lokur, Indra pointed out by giving various you know, real life examples about the political misuse of laws. And all laws are susceptible to misuse, some more than others. There is a, a user law theory, which is that you give any law in the hands of the police and you show me the man, I will show you the law. But th this is where the role of the judiciary becomes very, very important, especially in the case of national security legislations and anti-security, anti-terrorism uh, uh, laws, the way they are applied. So sedition, 
waging war against the nation, Preventive Detention Act, uh, earlier Tada Pota, now, now UAPA. What is, according to you, Justice Lokur, the role of the judiciary, especially the role of the magistrate, the role of the uh, lower judiciary, uh, when dealing with these cases where prima facie, there appears to be an abuse of law? Well, I think the, uh, you know, the, the judiciary has to be alive to situations, okay? It just can't, uh, you know, the, I, I, I don't accept that ivory tower theory at all. The judiciary has to be alive to situations. Now, you know, you have grades of offenses, all right? Uh, worst offense, if I may use that expression, is terrorism, all right? Then you have something a uh, little lower down in the ladder. Under the UAPA, you have something called an unlawful activity. Unlawful activity has been defined as, uh, you know, sovereignty, integrity of India and uh, secession and secession. Then you have IPC offenses, all right? Now you have uh, sedition, for example. Sedition talks about causing exciting or tending to excite disaffection uh, against uh, India, that is sedition. Now in one of these uh, statutes, uh, I think it is, uh, yeah, it's in uh, UAPA, causing or intending to cause disaffection is an activity which amounts to terrorism under, uh, uh, it, it, it's an activity which amounts to unlawful activity under the UAPA. Okay, so now you have the same act, the same act can be, a uh, person can be prosecuted under the IPC for sedition, 124A. That same person can be uh, prosecuted under the UAPA for an unlawful activity. Punishments are different. Provisions are different. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, you know bail and so on, but the offense is the same. The definition is more or less the same. One uses the word exciting, uh, you know. The other one says causing. So the judiciary has to make that distinction, and this is one of the distinctions which the Delhi High Court has made, in a sense, where they say that listen, if it can be done under the uh, IPC. Prosecute that person under the IPC, why do you have to go to uh, UAPA? All right. So, because UAPA is a much harsher provision in terms of punishment and so on, don't use that, you know, if the same result can be achieved by IPC. But if you think it is something, you know, much greater, now in this case, much greater would have to be terrorism, you know. So unless you equate sedition with terrorism, you proceed against uh, a person for uh, uh, sedition under IPC. If it is, you know, of, 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 of a nature which perhaps comes in the definition of unlawful activity, I don't, uh, offhand I can't say what would come under the uh, you know, definition of unlawful activity, a seditious act which would come under the uh, definition of unlawful activity, then you proceed under UAPA. Not that because I have the power to proceed under UAPA, forget about IPC, I'll proceed against you under UAPA. That distinction has to be made and appreciated by the judiciary because you are not dealing with an ordinary case. You're not dealing with an ordinary person. The case is one of terrorism or not of terrorism, right? The person is a terrorist or not a terrorist. You're dealing with the life and liberty of that person, supposing he's not a terrorist and it's not a case of terrorism. And you put that person behind bars and say, all right, you know, I'm throwing away the keys. The consequences are very serious. That is the uh, difference which I think the judiciary should appreciate. Right. right. So, Justice Lokur, this has been a perennial problem, which is of misuse, abuse, misapplication of anti-terror laws right from the mid 80s since we had Tada in place, then came Pota. It is well documented, Justice Lokur, that both under Tada, then under Pota, and now under UAPA, 
a large number of people who are detained and prosecuted eventually get acquitted. Now, the question still remains after three decades of our living ex lived experience with special, extraordinary anti-terror laws, how can we achieve sufficient judicial oversight of police and prosecutorial decision-making? Why that question still remains at large and what can the Supreme Court do to ensure that there is enough accountability and enough, as you uh, pointed out, that uh, the lower judiciary is alive to the situation? You see, the Supreme Court has said in Prakash uh, Singh's case long time back that there must be separation between the investigation and the uh, prosecution, right? Not implemented. All right, that's one. The second uh, thing is about uh, you know the judiciary being alive uh, to all this. Now, yes, there is misuse. Yes, there is abuse. But what about uh, you know National Security Act that is also being abused? Right. Today in the newspapers, I <laughs> found a very strange uh, uh, write-up. Uh, Madhya Pradesh High Court uh, set aside the preventive retention of a person because he was selling oximeters at an inflated price. Right now, I don't know how much an oximeter costs, maybe 1,000, 2,000 rupees. He couldn't have been selling it for 1 lakh or something. People are not so stupid. He must have been selling it for 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, whatever it is. He may have sold hundreds of them. Is that a question of national security? Right? So, <laughs> when you have these laws and they are abused, the judiciary has to come hard on the abuse. Nambi Narayan, right? The court said, Supreme Court said, listen, you pay costs. Compensation. Okay, 50 lakhs, I think. He loves me a question. Now, in a situation like this, or this oximeter thing, the fellow was in jail for about 50 days. Yeah? Why why can't the court say, all right, so what, what kind of a bogus <laughs> preventive detention order you have issued? Pay costs. Now, unless the court comes down heavily on the abuse of the law. I'm not saying misuse, because misuse, there can be different views. You know, uh, the trial court thinks it's a misuse, high court thinks it's not a misuse. Uh, judgments can be reversed. But abuse is pretty clear. Right. So there, I think the court should come down and tell them what, what, what is all this going on. Right. And you pay costs, compensation costs, whatever. Right. Uh Ms. Jaising, I would like to ask you, uh, Justice Lokur uh, has very uh, eloquently spoken about that how uh, each of these cases need to be more effectively, expeditiously dealt by the judiciary at various levels. Uh, from your experience as an additional Solicitor General, do you believe that state can prevent terrorism while also simultaneously guaranteeing human rights or must the police and the state trade off some human rights protections to effectively prevent or punish acts of terror. Okay, look, uh, that will be the end of the rule of law, the so-called trade-off, yeah. Uh, so I think it's very important to, to say it loud and clear that what we are talking about here is the protection of the rule of law, uh, the equal, Equality before law and equal protection of laws. So equal protection of laws means whether you're a terrorist or whether you're a saint, you're entitled to the same protection of the law. And therefore this trade-off, yeah. But you know, I, I can tell you, you wanted my experience as an ASG, let me tell you, as an ASG, I was handling a lot of cases on behalf of the CBI and prosecuting uh, uh, people against whom cases had been filed, including uh, police officers. And I can tell you that um, in the Surabuddin case, which is uh, more than famous, notorious as a case in this country, I've heard counsel uh, get up in court and argue, my Lord, uh, we should be thankful. Uh, by the way, on behalf of the accused police officer, these comments are made in court. My lords, we should be thankful 
that a dreaded criminal has been done to death. We should not be prosecuting the police officers who have done them to death, even if it was done extrajudicially. Now, what amazed me is that a submission like that is made in the highest court of the land and the judges listen, keep silent. I don't know what goes on uh, in the minds of judges, so I, I leave that comment over there. But, uh, but uh, Ashish, I would like to say that uh, our disappointment often is with the highest court of the land, that is the Supreme Court of India. We have noticed in the recent past, high courts have been giving judgments, which you could characterize as within the bounds of rule of law and therefore progressive. For example, I am deeply disappointed by the fact that the Supreme Court said, while admitting the appeal against the judgment of the Delhi High Court, this will not be treated as a precedent. Now, I have a comment to make on this. Uh, I, would have, I would have welcomed the admission of this appeal because we would like to see that interpretation endorsed by the Supreme Court of India. And it is not my case that this appeal should not have been admitted. You know the race against time uh, to get these people released on bail. And I fear that if they were not already out, then the Supreme Court may even have had the opportunity to stay the operation of the bail order. But that's just speculation. What is on the table is an order which says it shall not be treated as a precedent. Now, you know, in law, uh, the it is only a judgment given under Article 142, where the Supreme Court exercises extraordinary jurisdiction to do complete justice, that they can say, in the facts and circumstances, this will not be treated as a precedent. All other judgments of any court, including a constitutional court, which is a high court and a Supreme Court, no one, not even the Supreme Court, can say it shall not operate as a precedent because a precedent operates of its own force. It doesn't, it, it is not binding. The only question is what is the binding value of a precedent? Uh, a, a judgment of the Delhi High Court will not bind uh, any other high court in the country. They can use it as a persuasive uh, judgment. But to say that this cannot even be cited in another court, it shall not be treated as a precedent, I think goes beyond the four corners of the law. So therefore, uh, we are disappointed. And what really matters is judgments of the Supreme Court because they operate as the law throughout the territory of India under Article 141 of the Constitution of India. So we, we do, you did ask the question to Justice Lokur earlier that what can we do about a magistrate who refuses to read the plain text of the law and say, look, this is not an offense under UAPA. But my question is a bigger question. My question is, what do we do uh, the answer to that is only the Supreme Court can correct uh, what we call subordinate courts, and therefore we should focus our attention on what the Supreme Court does and doesn't do. Uh, Justice Lokur, you, I'm again going back to one of your articles where you wrote about the rule of law. And in that article, you wrote about the culture of impunity, and you said, confidence of the police that its conduct will not be inquired into leads to a culture of impunity. Now, when the police over and over again in cases gets away with blood on its hands or gets away with the stifling of whether free speech or civil liberties, uh, you think that this is leading to uh, a state of, of affairs where, uh, where there is terror in the hearts and minds of the people who don't necessarily agree with, uh, with the government of the day. And we, this will eventually erode not just the rule of law, but it will also eventually erode uh, the very democracy of which we are so proud of. Yes, you see, uh, it's like this, it's, it's actually not only the police, you know, 
for tickets also. Uh, bodies like the uh, organizations, like the Enforcement Directorate, uh, for example, or the Narcotics uh, Control Bureau. Now, if these uh, you know, authorities get away with doing something wrong, I mean, something which is patently wrong, right? It is definitely going to, uh, you know, have an impact on society. And that's why I, I think it's, it's a, you know, broader question than the ideological thing. Now, the enforcement directorate, for example, may not necessarily be concerned about ideology. Okay, but they can still, uh, you know, uh, get after a person, NCB, they may not be concerned about uh, ideology, but they can still get after a person. Uh, somebody like uh, Riya Chakravarti, for example, right? She was not opposing the government or anything, but they got after her. So once these, uh, uh, you know, uh, bodies like the police, NCB, ED, whatever, you know, uh, once they know that nothing is going to happen to us if we do something wrong, then fine, you know, we, we can take the law into our own hands. And that's when the rule of law becomes, uh, you know, compromised, so to speak. And right. that is what we have to be, you know, careful about. Right. Uh, and uh, uh, you have also at various points spoken about uh, compassion and expeditious justice and access to justice. And compassion is one element which we saw in your uh, uh, term when you were heading the social justice uh, branch of the Supreme Court, which we increasingly find lacking, not only when it comes to say, uh, disposing of bail applications, but also in various other cases like, uh, you know, PILs filed for say migrant laborers or people who were displaced uh, because of the overnight imposition of lockdown and so many other cases. Uh, I would like to ask you, uh, what do you think is the future of the of the social justice uh, jurisprudence in the country. You think there, 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 the, the social justice jurisprudence in the country has suffered a setback over the last few years in the way the higher judiciary has over and over again uh, uh, by si sided with the executive and, uh, and uh, for one reason or the other uh, failed to give enough succor and relief uh, to the dispossessed and the, and the underprivileged. Yeah, I think it has, it has suffered a setback. Uh, I'm pretty clear about that. You know, we, we are talking, uh, when we talk about uh, social justice in the context of the social justice bench, we are talking about disadvantaged persons, right? Marginalized persons. Now you had the situation of uh, uh, last year, you know, of the migrants. Now, the, obviously on the face of it, they were disadvantaged. I mean, they had to trudge back home. One girl had to, uh, you know, cycle, I think, 1,000 kilometers or something with her father, right? Now, if the court says that, listen, okay, uh, you know, so what if there's migration? Then there's something wrong. You know, you can't, you can't just ignore the plight of millions of people, okay? Even hundreds of people, you, you can't ignore it. You have homeless people, you have people who are unable to, you know, the cost of this COVID treatment, first of all, going to a hospital, spending uh, money in the hospital. A lot of people have got impoverished because of that. Can you say, well, you know, what can, what can we do about it? We can't do anything about it. You can't look at it, uh, you know, in that sort of a manner. I mean, you're, you're, we don't even treat you know, prisoners of war <laughs> in that way. Why, why should we treat our own uh, people like that? So I think compassion is very, very important. And uh, social justice is very important. But over the years, I think, uh, you know, things like, uh, you know, the economy or economic justice as distinguished from socioeconomic justice, you know, they, they, these have uh, been highlighted. Uh, how do you see um, the case of uh, Stan Swami, uh, an 85-year-old Jesuit priest, where he had to go to the courts over and over again for something as basic 
as a sipper or a straw? Yeah, that, that, that's a question of compassion. You know, if I remember correctly, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the jail authority said there's no provision, uh, there's no rule or whatever in the prison manual which says that you're entitled to a sipper or a straw. But is there a rule which says that you cannot be given a straw? There's no such rule. So if he asked for a straw, why can't it be given to him? You know, why is it that a negative is used to deny something to a person? Now, what, what is he going to do with a straw? He's just going to drink water or, you know, whatever he, he wants to drink with it. I mean, he, he can't start a revolution or something uh, with a straw. That's where compassion comes in. And then you say you go to court. Now, fine, there may be lawyers who have gone, uh, you know, pro bono, who have assisted him pro bono. But supposing a lawyer says, no, 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 you see, I, I need my fees. And he quotes a figure of, uh, you know, four figures for a straw, you know, which you can buy a packet of straws by I think about 50 rupees or 100 rupees or something. And what does he want? He just wants one straw. He doesn't want 100 straws. That's where compassion comes in. You know, or you have a situation like uh, uh, this uh, Natasha when her father died. Has there to be an argument that, oh, you know, I, she wants to go, her father has died? There doesn't have to be an argument on that. Yeah. That's where compassion comes in. Yes. And if that is lacking, you know, <laughs> then you're in trouble. Right. And uh, state functionaries, police, specialized agencies, prison officials, sometimes overtly, sometimes you know, indirectly, they trample upon civil liberties and sometimes even commit offenses. Uh, as a former judge of the Supreme Court, as a, as, a, as a jurist, you think that these kind of broad immunities, whether by convention or by law, which have been granted to government officials and state functionaries, are they, are they justified and necessary? And, no, and don't they like gnaw at the very spirit of the rule of law? Yeah, I think we, we have to have a relook at all this. We have to have a relook. Now, if you remember that uh, case of uh, Benny uh, and uh, his father in uh, Tutikurin, you know, who were bashed up and uh, they died, right? What has happened to the police? Yeah. It's been about a year or a year and a half. I don't know. What happened to those uh, people who, you know, staged an encounter or there was an encounter, one doesn't even know what happened yeah. uh, in Hyderabad when those four people were killed, right? What happened to that uh, person who was killed in an encounter or who was trying to run away uh, near Kanpur? He was killed. These are instances which are a year old, if not more. Contrast this with George Floyd. Yes. Within a year, that policeman has been convicted and sentenced. Yeah. And we are still trying to figure out, you know, whether the people who bashed up uh, Benny and his father, Benny and his father died. It's not that they were only bashed up, they died. We are still trying to figure out, you know, what happened. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. It can't be like that. Yeah. So we, we have to, we have to, you know, revisit all this. Yes. Otherwise, we're inviting trouble, you know, if we say, you know, it's, it's, it's a part of life. You know, it's been going on for the last seven years, and it'll go on for another couple of years, but in the next couple of years, that'll be the end of it. Indra, if I may ask you, uh, from your 50 years of long experience dealing with cases of human rights violations and, and violations of civil liberties, uh, how you think uh, one can ensure that special courts and special procedures enacted under anti-terror laws follow uh, judicial independence and the requisites of a fair trial? Uh, Ashish, I don't think I can answer this question without raising a few larger issues uh, in this discussion. and. Uh, what I have noticed is that as we speak, goalposts are changed. Now, if you, 
amend the law and say this is not the law, how do you expect a lawyer to go to court and argue, well, this is the law? Uh, let me give you uh, a couple of examples. Uh, if you take Article 370 of the Constitution of India, all you need to do is to amend uh, the law and say uh, the state government shall mean the central government. You've changed the goalpost. Uh, throughout your life, you've been arguing that it's the state which will take a decision what is the future of the JNK, and suddenly you turn around and say, no, it's the central government. So I can give you any number of examples of this. You take the CAA, okay? Uh, I've grown up all my life thinking that, almost thinking that everybody who was born in this country is a citizen, though citizenship in our country is not only based on birth, but then in a very creeping fashion, you have laws which say, no, uh, both your parents must have been of Indian origin. Then you say, one of them, uh, uh, the, uh, neither of them should have been an illegal migrant. And finally, you end up with a law which says, we will still give you citizenship, notwithstanding the fact that you entered as an illegal immigrant, provided, however, you happen to be a Hindu. So... I think there are, there are, you know, much, how does one answer a question like that? Okay, if you want to know my feeling, I can tell you my feeling. I don't have an answer, but when I started my practice as a social justice lawyer, I was under the impression that one just has to argue for social and economic rights, and then this country will be, uh, in a state of paradise, if we can just eliminate poverty, uh, uh, that's that's our only problem. But today, if you ask me the same question, I will say, I'm sorry, I was very mistaken. What I need more than my economic and my social rights is my political and civil rights. And uh, uh, because why? Because your civil and political rights give, gives you the right to speak up. Right, And I, I think that the people we are talking about, whether they are marginalized or whether they are political dissidents, they have only one weapon in their armory, and that is their voice. You take that away, and you have taken away their life. Okay, uh, There is nothing left to argue for. Then you can, you, know, you can give a person as much food as you want. You can give that person as much clothing and housing as you want. But if you don't give them the right to speak, you have achieved nothing. So I think we need to understand why is it in this country that the goalpost is changing all the time? Why is the secular character of the country being dismantled brick by brick? And unless we have an answer to that question, I don't think we can, uh, uh, people like me who are not in the judiciary on the other side, uh, I'm my tools for advocating for justice are being taken away systematically. And then what are you left with? You're left to the mercy of the Supreme Court. Now, we are not supposed to be left to the mercy of the Supreme Court. We are dependent on the law. And the law is a tool. It's a very powerful tool in our hands. So I would argue for the return of that tool. As we speak, Ashish, uh, Justice Lokur is surely aware of the fact that the Bar Council of India has just issued rules to say that you can't criticize the judiciary. And if you do, you'll be disqualified as a lawyer. Now, how can I answer your question, Ashish? I have no answers. Yeah. yeah. To, to be left to the, uh, uh, to be left at the disposal of the Supreme Court. Uh, if uh, I can go back to Justice Lokur, which is uh, this a new trend has emerged over the last few years, which is the tactical registration of FIRs. Uh, something you say, something you write, and then uh, different complainants in different parts of the country, they register an FIR coming, emanating from the same act or same uh, uh, article that I wrote. Uh, again, the Supreme Court uh, has dealt with these uh, kind of tactical registration of FIRs or this kind of abuse of territorial jurisdiction also in a very uh, uh, uneven manner. So again, uh, Justice Lokur, you wrote an article where you contrasted the Arnav Goswami case uh, with the Amish Devgan case and those two cases also with other cases where there was not uh, a relief for many uh, other uh, people who were on uh, the receiving end of the, those complaints. So. Uh, how do you deal with this, this new pattern that is emerging in a country 
that a writer, an author, uh, an activist is susceptible to facing simultaneous prosecutions, possible prosecution in different parts of the country for, for something as simple as writing an article. Yes. Again, that, that is an area that has to be looked at, uh, right? And uh, it's not only territorial, it, is, it can be a multiple uh, FIRs. For example, you write an article in Delhi today, all right? Somebody is unhappy with the article. And let me tell you, this is not something which is new, it is something which has happened in the past. So you write an article and somebody uh, you know, in the Northeast files an FIR against you. Okay. Now, according to Delhi police, it takes three days to go by Rajdhani from Delhi to uh, Guwahati. That's what the Delhi police told uh, the uh, trial judge when they wanted to verify Devangana Kanta's uh, uh, address. So somebody files a case against you in uh, some village or some you know, district of uh, Nagaland. Another person files something against you in uh, Jammu and Kashmir. Somebody files against you in Kerala or Lakshadweep, right? It's not easy to go. Somebody in Andamans. Okay, now, should that be permitted? You know, so this is something which has to be looked at. Now, this, this is sheer harassment. You know, the court, uh, the, the police says you come, no, you can't go to all these four, six, seven different places. So you have a problem not only of territory, but you have a problem of multiple FIRs filed against you. Now, when I said this has happened in the past, there was a time, you know, uh, under the Negotiable Instruments Act, the check is bounced. Yep. Right? Now, somebody in uh, Maharashtra, for example, or somebody in Karnataka, for example, gives a check which bounces. This person uh, opens a bank account in uh, Sikkim, right, and gets a notice issued from Sikkim and says, you come to Sikkim. Now, should that be permitted? You know, so we have to look at these laws because today many of them are being procedural laws. Many of them are being misused, if not abused. So we need to have a fresh look at many of these uh, things, uh, right? So yeah. I, I think this whole business of you know writing articles and ten FIRs being filed against you in ten different parts of the country is nothing but sheer abuse. How many people can actually go to the Supreme Court and say that listen, there are ten FIRs against me, and you please uh, club them and send them to one place? Yeah. Everybody can't go to the Supreme Court. Okay, but now I think what has <laughs> happened, which I think is very, very interesting. There was some uh, person uh, who was to be, uh, who was summoned by Delhi police a few days ago. He said, I'm not coming. All right. So the Delhi police said, you go to his house and you, uh, you know, question him over there, interrogate him over there. So they went to his house and they interrogated him. Probably the interrogation was not complete, whatever, I don't know. Then now the police are all right. Now you uh, appear before us through video conferencing. Okay, very good. Now, uh, Karnataka High Court has also passed a similar order with regard to uh, the chief of uh, Twitter in India that uh, the police in UP can examine him uh, through video conference. Do that. Then the police <laughs> will also come to their senses. So you don't have to bring Disha Ravi from uh, Bangalore to Delhi to question her. It can be done through video conference. Yes. Right. I think I think this, this is something which you know people should take advantage of. That you if you want to summon somebody and interrogate him, do it through video conference. Let's see what happens. Right. And uh, I would just like to end this uh, conversation, Justice Lokur, with. One uh, final question, which is uh, before the judiciary, especially the higher judiciary, some very profound questions of credibility uh, are looming large, especially when large number of people in this country, they believe that the process of justice 
is very uncertain, expensive, and torturous. You think as a former judge of the Supreme Court of India, do you feel concerned about the diminishing uh, faith uh, in judicial relief that a common man expects from the highest courts of this country? Uh, well, I, I, I do feel concerned, certainly. Certainly, I do feel concerned. Uh, you see, it's like this. Uh, the judiciary has had bad times in the past. All right. But there has to be the will to bounce back. And unless that will is shown by the Supreme Court, things may not improve. And let me tell you, uh, you know, after the emergency, the Supreme Court bounced back pretty fast. The emergency was over in uh, 77. In 79, we started getting these judgments of, uh, you know, local stand being relaxed in S.P. Gupta's case. You had uh, public interest litigation. It took two years, or maybe less than two years, for the Supreme Court to bounce back. But there was a will at that time. I don't know whether today there's a will or there is no will. If there is a will, perhaps the Supreme Court can bounce back. But if it is a chalta hai kind of attitude, there's a problem. Yeah. Indra, uh, if I can come back to you for one final question. As a civil rights lawyer with 50 years long practice, what do you think is the role of lawyers like you to ensure that judiciary is one uh, alive to the ground reality and uh, is uh, also alive to the need of a very expeditious and effective uh, uh, relief to people who have been wronged by the state. What, what what role do you think lawyers like you can play? Um, it is no longer possible to play a role uh, only inside the courts. I think uh, advocacy for civil rights has to be done inside and outside the courts. Yeah, and uh, the so that's one uh, so that's one way in which I think uh, we can move forward. Uh, because as I said, you know, at the heart of this debate is a political issue. What is the idea of India? Do we want to see an India which is uh, being, uh, where secularism is being dismantled? And, uh, or do we want to fight for the preservation of secularism, whether it's inside or outside the courtroom? I, I see that as a major role of, of civil rights lawyers because it's only in a secular framework that uh, people like us will get justice, not in a framework which is which has a, 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 a judicial Hindutva state would make it impossible for any uh, rights adjudication to take place because in that case you don't need a court, right? You, your your rights are then guaranteed by a government, and you don't need a court. To go to, so that is one uh, that is one role uh, that I see, and of course the other is to, uh, you know, inside a courtroom, to keep raising these issues uh, without fear. I think, uh, look, um, the there is a major problem with the with the way the legal uh, system functions. Uh, first, uh, there is in the judiciary and in the legal profession, uh, the institution of dynasty, okay? The second thing is that uh, most lawyers seem to think that their success depends on their finding favor with judges. Now, here is where I think that uh, the legal profession needs to undergo a role change. And we, a direct answer to your question is to argue fearlessly, politely, and in a dignified manner before a judge, your point of view, without worrying uh, that you're going to lose your case. Uh, I would suggest no compromises be made on what you see as the proposition of law, as the correct proposition of law, and not just uh, end up with uh, with ad hoc orders. The ad hocism in the judiciary has gone very far. And I must say that I don't enjoy uh, arguing my cases in a, in a court of law in an ad hoc manner. I think in the future, 
it is your uh, it is your skills your forensic skills uh, as a lawyer be, uh, grounded in constitutionalism uh, which is the way forward for civil rights lawyers in this country thank you so much uh, justice lokur uh, thank, thank you, you. Uh, miss indira for speaking to the leaflet and for this very illuminating and informative uh, conversation on uh, uh, accountable jurisprudence on compassionate jurisprudence on the rule of law and uh, a very very topical issue which is of uh, the anti terror and security laws and their uh, possible misuse and misapplication uh, i believe that there there will there is no other area of law which is being more vigorously contested and debated than the uh, issues related to law of sedition and uapa the supreme court of india has finally agreed Uh, to hear the constitutionality of section 124a which is a law of sedition all over again and i believe that the 2019 amendment of the uapa uh, is also under uh, challenge for its constitutional validity so we'll hear more from the supreme court more from uh, noted jurists like justice lokur and indira in the coming days on um, on issues of human rights and civil liberties and their interplay uh, with the laws of the land uh, hope to see you soon in um, uh, one new episode of leaflet with uh, where we'll be talking on a similar issue of public importance thank you for watching